recording or is it already started started yes assalam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh so in the last session we discussed about the conquest of makka and the battle of hunain and the battle of hunain was against primarily against the saki tribe from uh, the city of taif Okay, and the uh, Hawazin were also supporting them. So the Thaqif tribe used to live. Uh, yes, the Thaqif tribe used to live uh, in the Taif city, and Hawazin were the Bedouins who used to live in the outskirts of Taif. Okay. So after the Battle of Hunain, sorry. Yep. So after the conquest of Mecca, then we also discussed. Uh, there's an echo. Hello. Yeah. So after the conquest of Mecca, we discussed that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sallallahu alayhi wa sent several expeditions in order to destroy the idols that were uh, that were there in Hijaz. Okay. So we are going to discuss about a few of those expeditions, and they are of significance. Uh, they are of some importance. We are going to discuss them. So Yena bin Hisn was sent to Banu Tamim. Okay. So Banu Tamim, if you can see in the map, is somewhere here. Okay. So Banu Tamim. So Yena was sent there because Banu Tamim were pre uh, preventing the other tribes from giving the jizya. So they were encouraging other tribes not to give the jizya. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent an expedition against them, and Yena was successful. And he captured a few people in, the, in his expedition. He brought them back to Medina, and then the nobility of Banu Tamim came to Mecca. Sorry, came to Medina to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then they were boastful and they were prideful. Okay, so what they did was that they chose Utare bin Hajib from amongst them, and they said that okay, he is the chief orator and he is going to give a speech. Okay, and then he gave a speech, and then Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then chose uh, Thabit bin Qais against him. Right, so then Thabit bin Qais went up to the pulpit, and then he started his speech and he gave his speech. Okay, defending Islam and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then afterwards, then after the oratory competition was done, then as uh, as Zabrakan bin Badr was sent by Banu Tamim, the delegation of Banu Tamim, to uh, basically recite poetry. So this they used to have poetry competitions back in Arabia, and the poets were very high, highly esteemed. So he recited some poetry, and then Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent Hassan bin Sabit. And Hassan bin Sabit was the chief poet of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And therefore, he was he was sent, and he replied to Az Az Zabra Khan. And then the chiefs of Banu Tamim, when they uh, heard the reply of Hassan bin Thabit, so they said that the orator of the Muslims was better than their orator, and the poet of the Muslims was also better than their better than their their poet. Okay, so they, therefore they embraced Islam. And then afterwards, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then sent uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib to demolish Al Qulus. So Al Qulus was one of the Uh, one of the idols that was uh, worshipped by the Thai tribe. So, any idea? Have you ever heard of Thai? Thai? No, not Thai. 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 Have you ever heard of any famous person who has in his name Thai? You should know. He's very famous. Hatim Tai, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Hatim Tai was the chief of this Tai tribe, and uh, this tribe used to live somewhere here on the map, so northern Arabia, northern Central Arabia. And Hatim Tai, his son, he died uh, before Islam, and his his son then became the chief, and the name of his son was Adi ibn Hatim. And Hatim Tai was the legend in Arabia. He still is well known in Arabia as well as in Arabic-speaking countries, as well as in the Indian subcontinent as well. So Adi ibn Hatim was the son of Hatim Tai and the chief of the Tai tribe. So when Ali ibn Abi Talib went there uh, in an expedition against the Tai tribe, then Adi ibn Hatim, who was already a Christian, so he left his own people and he fled to the north of Arabia, near the border of the Roman Empire. Okay. And then Ali ibn Abi Talib then. Uh, captured some prisoners of war and brought them back to Medina. 
And then there was a woman amongst the prisoner of, prisoners of war. Then she began to say that she is a noble woman, so she wanted an audience with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave an audience to her, and then she said that she is the sister of Adi ibn Hatim. And therefore she should be, she is, she is from a noble lineage, so therefore she should be, uh, she should be freed. Okay, then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she said it three, three times, about three, thrice to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him a riding animal, and he, he freed her, okay, and then she accepted Islam. So when the riding animal was given to the sister of Adi ibn Hatim, so she went straight to Adi. And she went straight to Adi in the northern Arabia where he was hiding. And then she reprimanded Adi. And she said that you have left your own people. And then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is uh, the best of the people. So therefore, you should go there and you should at least uh, visit him and have a conversation with him and accept Islam. Okay, that is what you should do. So therefore, Adi ibn Hatim accepted this offer of his sister and he went to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then uh, when he met Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said him that uh, then he said that I am already a Christian why do I have to accept another another religion okay, so I already have a fair good enough religion there is no need for me to accept Islam so then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that you are a Christian but I know about your religion more than you do so then Adi ibn Hatim said how then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that don't you charge one fourth your your people? Don't you tax them one fourth uh, of the of the produce? Then he said yes, I tax them one fourth. Then Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that isn't this forbidden in your religion? And he already knew that it, it is forbidden in the in the religion, but his common day people did not knew it, right? So therefore he was taxing them more than that was allowed in his religion. Okay, so here he used to follow. Uh, right now there are many speculations among amongst historians which sect of Christianity he used to follow. Okay. So there was a, so some people say that this was a mixture of Jewish and Jew, Jewish religion, Judaism and Christianity. And there was some sect that used to exist in the north of Arabia. And therefore he used to follow, Adi ibn Hatim used to follow that particular sect of Christianity. Okay. And in that sect, their law was that you cannot charge more than a certain amount that was less than one fourth. Okay. So therefore Adi ibn Hatim used to charge more than what he was allowed. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi pointed that uh, to him and then he of course when Muhammad Sallam said he was astonished as to how Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam know more about his religion right even though there was no bible in Arabic his the teachings were not in Arabic they were not translated into Arabic so he was astonished so then but he was reluctant to accept Islam because he was a uh, because amongst the Muslims at that time there was see, see uh, the Muslims are poor at that time and therefore when he saw poverty so therefore, that kind of uh, made him a bit reluctant to accept Islam. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then took him to his own abode. And then when he was discussing with him, when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was discussing with him and offering him to accept Islam, then a few people came to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then they complained of steal, stealth and robbery. Okay, they said that there are people who steal and there are people who rob as well. And then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then said to Adi ibn Hatim, as regards to stealing and robbery, so this is a hadith in Bukhari which I am reading. So as regards to steal, stealing and robberies, there will shortly come a time when a caravan will go to Makkah without any guard. Okay. So all the way from Syria to Makkah, a caravan will go and there would be no one who would harass them or would steal from them. Okay. And and regarding poverty, because people were complaining complaining of poverty as well, and Adi ibn Hatim was also seeing poverty around him, so that was making him reluctant to accept Islam. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave this prediction that regarding poverty, the hour will not be established, which means the day of judgment will not come uh, until one of you wanders about uh, with his object of charity and will not find anybody to accept it. Okay. So then Abi, Abi, uh, Adi ibn Hatim says that uh, I, the first one, which is going from Makkah to Medina, sorry, Makkah, going to Makkah from Medina, right? In another hadith from Syria to, uh, from Syria to Hijaz, right? So without any card, this was fulfilled during his lifetime. Okay, and that was uh, the, when the Muslim Empire became stable and spread. Then it brought with it a lot of security. Okay, so therefore the Muslims could travel long distances without needing any card. And then he said that I am sure that this particular prediction that there will be no one left to take charity, this is also going to come to fruition. So then the scholars say that this came into fruition when Umar bin Abdul Aziz, the Umayyad 
Caliph Omar bin Abdul Aziz became the Caliph. So therefore, because of his policies, uh, he distributed the zakah. And because of his policies, then there was no longer any person who would accept charity. Okay. So this particular prophecy was also fulfilled during the time of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. Then other expeditions were sent, such as Qutba bin Amir to Khasam, and then Al-Qama to Jeddah, and then Tufail ibn Amr to Yemen. To destroy, destroy another idol. So these are there were many expeditions sent. So we are going to skip over them. And then finally, then Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because the Islamic empire and the Islamic uh, uh, yeah the empire is spreading. So then the empire needs administration. Okay, it needs bureaucracy, and the taxes have to be collected. The the ones who are not Muslims, jizya has to be collected from them. The ones who are Muslims, zakat has to be collected from them as well. Okay, and then. Uh, therefore, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then assigns tax collectors to different provinces, and then as was the uh, as was the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he used to place a lot of emphasis on education. Okay, so he therefore he sent a lot of teachers all across the Arabia. The Sahaba were sent so that they would teach Islam to the newly converted people, and then he also made a few of them governors. Some of the people who were they were also governors and tax collectors. Okay. So there were these the uh, there were some people who used to play um, a, a few few roles, right? But then he sent all of these he sent uh, different sahabi with these different roles to different areas of Hijaz, different uh, areas of Arabia, which came under the dom uh, dominion of Islam. Okay? And therefore, we see that the Islamic Emirate now is being established. Okay. Now. Uh, Battle of Hunain, we discussed this last time that the Muslims got the largest war booty during the Battle of Hunain. Lots of many, many camels and many goats. So thousands and thousands of camels, thousands and thousands of goats. Okay, So that was the largest war booty that the Muslims had ever gathered up until that time. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then distributed it amongst uh, the people. He distributed it uh, freely amongst the people. And the people whom he distributed against were mostly the new converts. Okay, the ones from different tribes who had joined the Muslims and they were new converts and their hearts have not been solidified, or the ones who uh, you or the ones who were the chief and the noble people. Okay, so noble the nobles from other tribes, so he gave it to them so that in order to form uh, stronger alliances with them, okay, in order, in order to make their hearts hearts firm in Islam because they're going to see. That Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has conquered this large war booty, and he's freely giving them away to uh, freely giving the war booty away to the people. So they are going to be firm in their religion that he is a true prophet. He is not a king, right? And he is not pretending to be a prophet because a true prophet only can give all of the war booty that he has given to different uh, to to the people. Okay. So then nothing was left for him, and nothing was left for Ansar as well. So then the Ansar are seeing that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is distributing all of these uh, war booty to other people. And therefore, they became a bit uneasy right, that all the war booty is going to different people. So then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he heard about it, then he went to the Ansar. He had an audience with them, uh, uh, an audience just with the Ansar. And he said that, aren't you happy that the other people, they are going away with worldly provisions and you're going with the Prophet of Allah. Then the Ansar, they started crying. And they, then they said that, yes, we are happy. So therefore, these, their, also, their unease was also alleviated by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then after the Battle of Faber in the seventh year of Hijrah, then the Fadak was a land that was given to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this land was the uh, main source of provision for, for the family, for the Ahlul Bayt, okay, for, for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also for his family. So the produce which used to come from this land, that was the source of income for the family of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. And there is a, a hadith in which uh, Jibreel al -Islam then came to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam along with another angel. And he, the angel then asked Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, do you want to be a malik, which means a king, a king, a prophet who is a king, or do you want to be a prophet who is an abd? Abd means a slave. Okay, So abd, abd sub, slave of Allah. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then chose uh, that I'm going to be a prophet who's going to be an abd. An abd me meant that he had to live in poverty and he had to live, uh, yeah, he could not live a luxurious life in this world. Okay, so he chose not to live a luxurious life in this world instead of living like a king. So then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the income that used to come to him was very meager. And then there's a hadith in Bukhari as well, 
in which Urwa narrates from Aishra Zilatalan. Urwa was the nephew of Aishra Zilatalan. And Aishra Zilatalan says that uh, months used to go by and we used to survive only on two black things. Okay, so black water, which means dirty water, and also black dates. Okay, so for months they used to have no cooking, no food, only surviving on dates and water. Okay, so the the, the wives of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and alongside Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they used to live in lot, uh, in poverty, okay? And they barely had food to eat and dirty water to drink. So now after the conquest of Makkah, after the Battle of Khaybar, and after the, uh, especially after the Battle of Hunayn, now lots of wealth has come to the Ummah, but not to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is maintaining the lifestyle which he had before the Battle of Hunayn. So the wives of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then made a legitimate halal request that they why don't you increase our standard of living okay. and then they joined hands together and they started complaining to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we should increase our standard of living as the other people they're standing the standard of living is also increasing they're getting more money so we should also increase our standard of living so then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained to them that he cannot do it because he has made a promise that he is going to live a life of humility in this world so therefore the wives then did not listen so then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and they they joined 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 hands in order to demand this with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became disappointed and he uh, made an oath with himself that he is not going to see his wives again for one month okay and then he left his uh, and he left his house and then he went to uh, the Prophet's mosque and then in the Prophet, Prophet's mosque there was a small room for him and he went there and he started living there and then Omar Radhiyatalan, what used to happen was that Omar Radhiyatalan had a neighbor, and he used to have a, a, a contract with the neighbor, a verbal contract that one day you are going to take care of all the work, all the physical work, physical labor, and then I'm going to go and have an audience with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and learn from him. Okay. And then the other day I'm going to do it, and then you are going to go to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and learn from him. Okay. So they used to have alternating days in which one day they would learn and one day they would do the work. So then one day the neighbor then banged on the door of Umar Radhiyatalan and then he's Umar Radhiyatalan came out and he said, as the kings of the Ghassanids. Ghassanids, do you guys remember? Who were the Ghassanids? Who were the Ghassanids? Ghassanids were the Arab tribes who were allied to the Romans. And the Muslims fought them again in the Battle of Mukta. Okay. And so, so, uh, so Umar Radhiyatalan then said, has the kings of the Ghassanids attacked? So what has happened? Has he attacked? So from this, we realized that the Muslims were anticipating an attack from the Ghassanids. Okay. And that we are going to discuss it more later, uh, later when we are going to do the Battle of the Boot. So now the, uh, then the neighbor of Umar Radhiyatalan said that no, Ghassanid, even worse thing has happened that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has divorced all of his wives. Okay, so the rumor spread that when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not go to his home, the rumor spread that he has divorced all of his wives. wives. So then Omar Razila Zaran immediately went to his own daughter, Hafsa. And he asked her what happened. Has Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam divorced all of you? Then Hafsa said that we don't know if he has divorced us or not. Then Omar Razila Zaran then reprimanded Hafsa and he could do it because he was a father. So then after visiting Hafsa, then he went to the mosque of the Prophet, right, Masjid, Masjid Tanawi. And then he went to the small room in which Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was living. And then he asked the servant if he can have a private audience with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So then the servant went went inside and then Muhammad Sallallahu did not say anything. So he asked for three times. And then after the third time, then Muhammad Sallallahu granted him the audience. And then he came inside. And after the greetings, after the salam, he said, he asked him if he has divorced all of his wives. Then Muhammad Sallam said that no, I have not. Then Umar Zilatan said, Allah Akbar. Okay, instead of saying wow or amazing, right, like we do today. So the sunnah of the Prophet uh, and, and his sahaba was that whenever they used to hear good news, they would always say Allah Akbar. Okay. So then afterwards, then uh, Umar Zilatan tried to lighten the mood. So therefore he began recalling the stories of the past. So then he said that when we were in Makkah, right, the men were the dominant and the women were not dominant, right? But in Medina, it has become the opposite. The women have become dominant and the men have become <laughs> the men have become dominated by men have, men have men are being dominated by the women. So then Muhammad Sallam then smiled. Then afterwards, he also told Muhammad Sallam that he went to Hafsa and he explained to her that he should not do this. 
then during that during that time when they were discussing this then mom sallam was uh, leaning back on something on on a on you can say a date farm right so that used to be his uh, place of resting so then when he any any stood up from there then umar ghazali talan saw the uh, the what what can you say the marks of the date farm right on his back then umar ghazali talan started crying and when umar ghazali talan entered so i forgot this so he said that he also narrated himself he said that i only found in it in the room some barley a semi tanned leather bag of water a chamber pot and then he therefore he began to cry okay so he began to cry because there was nothing practically there were just so few things in the in that small room uh, in which mohammed sallam was consuming and he also had marks on his back because of the because of the uh, resting place because of the date palm trees on which he used to rest so then omar radhi sallam said that the uh, the kisra and faisal you guys know who are kisra and faisal anyone kisra and faisal Kaiser was not Alexander. Kaiser was Caesar. Caesar. Yeah. Kaiser was the title of the Roman emperor. Okay. So at that time, the Roman emperor was emperor was Heraclius. So he used to be called Kaiser. So any Roman emperor would call himself Kaiser. And when the Ottomans they also conquered Mehmed the Fath Mehmed Fathi he also conquered in fourteen fourteen fifty three. He also said, "I am the Kaiser." Okay. So that continued. even after the roman empire was uh, finished okay. so kisra was the uh, king of the persian empire khosrow okay. parvez now umar radhi allahu anhu said that kaisar and kisra they have luxurious lives and you are the habib of allah and you are living in such poverty so he began crying then muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that why are you why are you crying umar so aren't you happy that they have got this world and we have got the hereafter okay. so then umar radhi allahu anhu was satisfied then afterwards allah revealed this particular verse that o prophet say to your wives if you desire the life of this world and its luxury then come i will give you a compensation and let you go graciously okay so the option was given to all the wives that if you want the luxury of this world then you can get a divorce and then you can go and imam sallam is going to give them a compensation and they can go and live with someone else and the next verse says but if you desire allah and his messenger and the everlasting home of the hereafter then surely allah has prepared a great reward for those of you who do good okay the next one the next ayah says that if they are going to stay and if they are going to do good then a great reward awaits them so then mohammed sallam then recited it to all of his wives and he asked them if they if they if they want to leave then they are free to go but if they want to stay then they can stay but they have to live in relative poverty so then all of them decided decided to stay with mohammed sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay then from this uh, incident we also Uh, get to know that the Muslims were anticipating an attack from the Pakistanis. Okay, so now uh, the delegations. So from the fifth year of Hijrah onwards, the delegations of different tribes used to come to Medina and visit Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And sometimes they would negotiate a treaty, and a uh, few times they would accept Islam as well. Okay, so these delegations became the most frequent in the ninth year of Hijrah, and therefore it is called the year of the delegations. So there were many of them. uh so there is a there are phd dissertations on the delegations that came to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam right uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages so many of the delegations came but i have just mentioned about five or six of them who were the most important ones okay so the first one was the tribe of abdul qais from bahrain so this was the this was in the fifth year of hijra the first delegation came in the fifth year and then the second delegation came in the ninth year and when they came in the fifth year of hijra then they asked muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that tell us something which is going to cause us to enter jannah and then muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam told them that you observe the you give the shahada you observe the uh, salah then then you fast and then you give the zakah why not the fifth one why didn't he ask them to perform the hajj very good very good <laughs> so hajj has not become a, became obligatory because the makkah was still not conquered okay so in the fifth year of hijra this particular tribe came from bahrain and this is significant because this was the first tribe from outside of the hijaz region which came voluntarily and accepted islam okay and it was from bahrain so still to this day the people of bahrain are very proud of it that we are the ones who accepted islam before voluntarily before any anywhere else from outside the hijaz region okay and then the tribe of those from yemen came 
to Medina in about seventh year of Hijrah. And the tribe of those came because their chief by the name of Tufail ibn Amr. So he he had an interesting story that he went to Makkah when Muhammad Sallam was still in Makkah. Okay? And he was Muhammad Sallam used to give the dawa to the pilgrims. He used to proselytize to the pilgrims who used to come from different places in Arabia. So the pagan Quraysh they used to uh, warn the pilgrims that there is a there is a there is a poet there is a madman amongst us who says that he has got a revelation from God from Allah and therefore you should not listen to him. Okay. So people generally used to avoid Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to continue his dawah. So then Tufail he went there he went to Makkah and he was warned so he put wool inside his ears right so that he could not listen to the recitation of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then he thought to himself that. I am a chief of this particular tribe from Yemen, those, okay, and the Yemenis were considered more cultured than people from other tribes of Arabia because Yemen was more closer to civilization, okay? And Yemen also had its own mini kingdoms and they used to be kings. Instead of tribal system, they used to have, uh, they, they used to have a semi-tribal system, okay? So they were more civilized, you can say, than the, than the tribes that were further up north. So then he said that I'm from, I'm a chief of those, so I should not be intimidated by anyone saying anything. So he removed his, uh, the wool that he had inside his, uh, inside his ears, and then he listened to the Quran and he became Muslim. And then he went back to his own people and he gave dawah. And then because of his dawah, then uh, about 72, 80 families, they converted to Islam and they visited Medina, uh, along, uh, yeah, they visited Medina to meet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. And Tufail ibn Amr is from the Dawah of Tufail ibn Amr. So even before uh, Muhammad Sallam migrated to Medina, Tufail ibn Amr also invited Muhammad Sallam to come to Daus. Okay, but then which was uh, towards the south, but then Daus is here, right? As you can see on the map as well. But then Allah did not give him the permission to go to Daus. Okay, now Allah had planned uh, yesterday for him, so he did not give him permission. So Muhammad Sallam did not go there. So and from the Dawah of Tufail ibn Amr, one very prominent Sahabi became Muslim and he was also from Daos. Any idea? Anyone knows? Okay, hint. It's going to be very easy after the end. So he has the most number of narrations, most number of Hadith narrations. Abu Hurairah accepted Islam and then he came to Muhammad Islam in 8th year of Hijrah. And he stayed there with uh, Muhammad Sallam for about two years and three months. Okay. Yes. 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 So we can, you can ask me the question later, right? So, yeah. Okay. Whatever question is in your mind, you can ask me later. So now we can talk about Abu Ghraira, inshallah, in the Q&A session. So then, uh, yeah. So those also accept 70 to 80 families from those also accepted Islam due to the efforts of the Pale Ibn Amr. And then came the delegation of Banu Saad bin Bakr. Any idea, Banu Saad bin Bakr? Banu Saad? Which tribe is this? Banu Saad bin Bakr. Second session. You are close, close. Yes, foster mother. Yes, Halima Sadia right, from Banu Saad. So this is a sub tribe of Hawazin tribe. Okay, so Hawazin sub uh, Hawazin is the tribe which surrounds Taif, the city of Taif, and this is one of the sub tribes. And their chief was Dimam Ibn Thalaba, and Dimam Ibn Thalaba they were Bedouins, so he was a very strong hairy man so he came and he came straight barged into the door of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then Muhammad Sallam was still polite to him and the Imam said that okay uh, because Muhammad Sallam had already sent a message emissaries to them and asked them to accept Islam so then the Imam said that uh, who created the heavens and the earth he started questioning Muhammad Sallam right he said who created the heavens and the earth then Muhammad Sallam said Allah then he said, who created the humans? He, the Muslims said, Allah. Okay. And then he said that, the Imam said that you are the one who claimed to be from, who has come from Allah, right? Who has been sent by Allah. So are you the messenger? Are you going to swear? Then Muslim said that I'm going to, I swear by Allah that I'm the messenger of Allah. Then the Imam then asked about uh, prayer. He said that, do I have to pray five times? 
then Muhammad Sallam said that yeah, you have to pray five times. Then he asked about fasting. Then he asked about the zakah. Then he asked about uh, what is the other one? Zakah and which one? I'm, yeah, he, he has he already asked about Hajj, right? Still the uh, sorry, Hajj is not Hajj is not there. Okay. So then he asked about these four. The Shahada is already uh, he, he already asked before, right? Who has created the heavens and the earth? So he has already already asked that theological question. So then afterwards he accepted Islam, and with with him. When he went to his own tribe and he told his tribe that he has accepted Islam, so his old tribe then accepted Islam. Okay, and then came the delegation of Banu Thaqif in the ninth year of Hijrah. Banu Thaqif is the main tribe in Thai that fought against the Muslims at the Battle of Hunain. Okay. So now, Battle of Hunain, the after the Battle of Hunain, their main chief Urwa ibn Masud. Ring the ring. Any anyone remembers Urwa ibn Masud? Going to be difficult to remember, but the one who puts the families up, right? Or the one? No, no. He was the one who negotiated on behalf of the Quraysh. Tried to negotiate on behalf of the Quraysh during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So he went and he asked Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the question: Why are you coming to? Why are you fighting against your own family? What religion are you bringing? You have people among you who I cannot recognize. Okay. So he is the one. Or why is and then he saw, uh, then he went to the Quraysh and he said that I have been to many places, but I have not seen anyone as devoted to the leader as to as the Sahaba to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. Then Urwa ibn Masood, when he was negotiating, when he was uh, asking Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam these questions, then he was frequently holding the beard of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. If you remember, I also told him that uh, with IBS session. So then when he was holding the beard, then someone tapped a sword on him. Then he looked up, and that was his nephew, Mumira ibn Sulma. He had already accepted Islam, and I had already told that he was a highway robber before accepting Islam. Okay, so now when he accepted Islam, Muhammad Sultan said that we accept your Islam, but we don't accept your money. Okay, your money is haram, so you are not going to accept it, but we accept your Islam. So then he accepted Islam, and he let go of uh, robbing other people, became highway robber, right? So he became, a, he was integrated into, into the society. So then Mughira ibn Shoba then said to his uncle that do not hold the beard of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then Uqba ibn Masood told him that haven't you humiliated us enough? So then Mughira then uh, did not say anything after that. Okay, Because Mughira was a highway robber, so he was, uh, the whole tribe was humiliated with that. The, the people from amongst them is someone who is robbing other people. Okay, So then Uqba ibn Masood in the eighth year of Hijrah, after the Battle of Hanayim, he became a Muslim. And he became a Muslim. He went to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he took the Shahada in Medina. And then he was he went he started go, uh, preparing for going back to Taif. Okay. So then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that why are you going back to Taif? Your people are going to harm you. And Urwa said that no, my people are going to. He was the chief, so he said that my people are so ob obedient to me and they love me so much that if I'm sleeping, they are not going to wake me up. Okay. So they are going to stand there and they are going to wait for me to. Uh, wake up and then they're going to tell me anything. Okay, so they respect me so much. But then when he went to Taif and he uh, uh, he started preaching to other people of Taif and then they became his enemies. And then the next day uh, during Fajr prayer, then he started giving the Adhan. And when he was giving the Adhan, someone shot an arrow and killed him Okay, at that, uh, in Taif. So Urwa bin Masood was martyred by his own people. So then his nephew, uh, when the city of Taif and the people of Thaqif, they saw that the Muslims are becoming stronger and stronger. So they realized they have no option but to go and negotiate with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. So they reached via Mughira ibn Shoba, who was from amongst the Taif, from, sorry, from amongst the Thaqif. So then Mughira ibn Shoba uh, went there to give the news to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Thaqif has also come to Medina. But then Abu Bakr, in, uh, he met with Abu Bakr and then Abu Bakr asked him, that please give me the permission to give this news to Muhammad Sallam, right? So their Sahaba are competing to make Muhammad Sallam happy. So then Mughir ibn Shoba gave the permission and then Abu Bakr went to Muhammad Sallam and he told him that the tribe of Thaqif have come, have come to visit you. And now Muhammad Sallam is happy and he treats, uh, treats, uh, treats them with uh, utmost hospitality and gives them uh, and is, is, is very generous to them. Then Thaqif then uh, start asking questions to Muhammad Sallam, right? So then Muhammad Sallam, of course, they, he tells them to accept Islam. So they'll start asking questions. 
and they say that uh, our entire income is based on riba. So what should we do? So then Muhammad Sussam says that, said that you should keep the principal amount. Okay, that is yours. You should keep that. So then they said that okay, give us some concessions on zina. Okay, then Muhammad Sussam said that no, no concession here. And then they said okay, we live in a place which is relatively cold. So just let us just drink something. Right? Let us have a khamr. Let us have khamr. Khamr is alcohol. So then Muhammad Sussam said that no, no, no concession on alcohol as well. Then they started negotiating on the tawheed, right? So let us have a lot for some time. A lot was the second greatest idol in Arabia after Hubal. Okay, so that was uh, also under the possession of Safi. So uh, they said that okay, let us have a lot. Then Muhammad Sussam said that we it is not not negotiable. Then they started negotiating on salah. Okay, let us have some less salah. Let's 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 not, let's uh, skip a few salah. Then Muhammad Sussam did not she said that this is not possible. Okay. Then they started negotiating on fasting as well. Okay, let, how about we just don't fast or we fast less than other people? The most of them did not give it to them. Then they said that, okay, how about we do not give zakah uh, and we do not do jihad? Then most of them gave that to them that, okay, uh, do not give zakah and do not do jihad. Then after they went, then most of them said that they are going to give zakah and they are going to do jihad. So now these scholars, they, they are, uh, they, have a different opinion on what that means. Okay, so some say that it means that Mama Susan said that when Islam is going to enter into their hearts fully, then they are going to give the zakah and they are going to give jihad as well. And this is and they are going to do jihad as well. And this is what happened. Okay, so when they became firm Muslims, then they gave the zakah and the zakah, then they, they participated in jihad as well. Okay, so the next one is the tribe of Banu Hanifa, and this is another tribe of uh, Muslim the false prophet. Now, Muslima had already converted to a sect of Christianity, and therefore he is now he is considered as the civilized person amongst the Arabs. And his own tribe, Banu Hanifa, considers him a, considers consider him a very learned man. Okay, and they respect him a lot. So now, Muslima he visits and his tribe, Banu Hanifa, a delegation from there also visits Medina, and then Muhammad Sallam. Uh, meets the uh, meets with Muhammad Sallam, and then Muslima says to them that okay, I am going to accept Islam, but we share the dominion and we share the prophethood. Okay, so I am going to be like Harun was to Musa. I am going to be a prophet as well. You just make me a prophet, and you make me a king of half of your dominion, and you, I am going to accept Islam. Then Muhammad Sallam said that I am not going to give you a branch, let alone give you half of the dominion and prophethood. I am not going to give you uh, even a single branch. And then Muhammad Sallam said that you are the one who I saw in a dream, and Allah is going to humiliate you. Okay. And then the dream was the Sahabi asked another Sahabi, what was that dream? So then uh, the Sahabi told the dream that Muhammad Sallam told that, that Sahabi that the dream was that while I, which means Muhammad Sallam, when he was sleeping, he saw in his hands two gold bangles. And this had a disturbing effect on him. And uh, he was given a suggestion in the sleep that he should blow over them, Okay, blow over the bangles. So he blew over them and they were no more. And in and then he interpreted these two, these as the two great liars who would appear after after him, which after which were going to appear after Muhammad Sallam. And one amongst them was Ansi. Aswad, Aswad al Ansi was one of the false prophets, which we also discussed last year. Okay, the inhabitant of Sana'a. And the other was Musalma, the inhabitant of Yaman. Okay. Now, finally, the delegation of the Christians of Najran, which is famous, also of quoted. In the videos as well, that they came. And Najran was uh, Najran is should be somewhere here. I think uh, Najran Najran is here, right? South of Arabia. So these people are in contact with the civilization here in Ethiopia, in Rome as well. So therefore, they are Christian. Okay. So they also come to Muhammad and it is they went to the mosque. And it is the time to, to pray. Then Muhammad Sallam gives them the place for to prayer. Okay. Then after they pray, they start uh, sort of like debating and discussing and debating with Muhammad Sallam. Okay. So they ask about Jesus, uh, Isa Alayhi Salam, and then Muhammad Sallam, uh, the verse, the verses of Ali Imran is uh, revealed that Isa Alayhi Salam is just like Adam Alayhi Salam. Uh, Allah said, "Be," and he was. Okay. And then Muhammad Sussam describes then the, to them that Isa is not a god or a son of God, he is just a messenger. Okay. And therefore, uh, this, this particular question was answered. 
and then they asked about Ibrahim alayhi salam, and they asked that whether Ibrahim alayhi salam was a Christian or a Jew. Okay, and then Allah also revealed in Surah Al Imran that Ibrahim alayhi salam was neither a Christian nor a Jew, but he was from amongst the people who submitted, which means that he was a Muslim. Okay, Muslim means that someone who submitted his will to the will of Allah. Okay, so now this answer was also uh, this this was also answered by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Then finally, after two or three days of debating, then they were not willing to accept Islam. Okay, because they they had, they had already uh, their answer, their questions had already been answered, but they would still not accept it. Okay, so then Muhammad Sallam said that uh, did this particular thing, right? Uh, uh, the Allah, Allah told him to do this thing, which is called mubahala. Okay, and in the Quran it says that then whoever still urges, uh, sorry, argues with you about it after knowledge has come to you, say, come, let us call our sons and your sons, our women and your women ourselves and yourselves then supplicate earnestly and invoke the curse of Allah upon the liars okay so this is the final final solution if they are debating for two or three days they are not they are, they are they are all questions have been answered they're still not budging then what you have to do is that you call all of your, your family right the Muhammad Salam call Fatima Hassan Hussain and Ali okay so you call your family and then they call their family okay and then you say okay the, uh, may the curse of Allah be on the liars okay and may the curse of Allah be on me and my family if I am the liar, okay? And then they say that may the curse of Allah be on us and our families if we are the liars, okay? Then Muhammad Sallam then gathered the al the Hassan Hussain and Fatma and Ali al oops, sorry, and then he uh, covered them with a cloak, ready to uh, accept the challenge, ready, he challenged them to, uh, and they did not accept the challenge, okay? And then they left and they said that we are going to pay the jizya, okay? So, after this, then uh, Kaab ibn Zuhair also converted to Islam. So he was the main poet of Arabia. He was the, Hassan bin Sabit was the poet of the Muslims. And Kaab ibn Zuhair was the main poet of Arabia. So the entire Arabia knew Kaab ibn Zuhair. So the poets at that time were the celebrities. So they used to be known all over Arabia. And if you wanted to uh, have, if you wanted to spread something, spread news or do propaganda, you do it through poets. Okay. So they were very very cherished in the society. So Kaab ibn Zuhair, then his brother had converted to Islam and then he started writing poetry against Islam and against Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay? And then afterwards his brother said to him that if you should accept Islam and come to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's going to accept your, uh, I mean he, he's very generous, he accepts the apology of people who come to him and accept Islam. Okay? So then he came to Medina and then afterwards he accepted Islam and the Sahaba when they saw him they wanted to kill him but then Muhammad Sallam uh, prevented them and then he came and, and he accepted Islam and therefore the greatest Arab poet in Arabia at that time he also accepted Islam okay. okay so after during this year during the ninth year of Hijrah uh, during the month of Rajab then uh, Muhammad Salam went into an expedition which is called Qazwa Tabuk and in the Sahaba used to call it Jaish al-Usra any idea what does that mean Usra Jaish, Jaish al Usra. Excellent, very good. Find them out, Usri Usra. Right? Usra is difficulty. The army of difficulty. Okay. Or the expedition of difficulty. So it is called the expedition of the, or, or the army of difficulty because there were lots of difficulties which the Muslims encountered during this particular Ghazwa. Okay. So Ghazwa Tabuk, the Muslims. Uh, so there are several reasons given as to why the Qazwa Tabuk happened. Okay. So the first reason is uh, the we are going to mention two. So the first reason we have already alluded to that Umar when he said that has the king of the Ghassanids attack. So we can we can say that the Muslims were anticipating an attack from the Ghassanids, from the Romans and the Ghassanids. So after the Battle of Muta, the Ghassanids wanted to uh, further attack, further go into Arabia and attack and attack and finish the Muslims. It is, it is uh, also written in some of the books that some of the tribes that were coming from Syria, they also told the Muslims that the Ghassanids are preparing for a war. Okay, And another reason that can be said is that Allah directly ordered them to go and to fight against the Ghassanids and the Romans. And that is also a very credible, uh, credible suggestion because the Muslims went in the month of Rajab, which is, if you calculate, that is the month of July. And that is the peak heating season. And that is also the season of harvest. Okay, so that is why this is called the 
the matter of difficulty, the army of difficulty, because it was difficult in every aspect. Okay, so it is the month of July and it is very hot. And therefore, the Muslims are going into this particular battle. So Allah has commanded them, and they also it is also possible that the Ghassanis were also planning to attack them. So therefore, the Muslims said, uh, uh, sorry, the Muslims sat in Rajab during the ninth year of Hijrah to go to to go up north and to fight against the Ghassanis and the Romans. Okay. And in Surah Tawbah, from verse 38 onwards, all of it is uh, uh, all of it is battle of uh, Tabuk. Okay, Tabuk. So before verse 38, it's after the battle of Tabuk. Okay? So after verse 38, it is battle of Tabuk. So verse 38 says that, "Oh, you have believed. What is the matter with you that when you are told to go forth in the cause of Allah, you are there heavily to the earth?" Okay, Surah Tawbah is all about Qital. It's all about Jihad. Are you satisfied with the life of the world rather than the hereafter? But what is the enjoyment of the worldly life compared to the hereafter except a very little? Okay, so Allah is strongly encouraging them, not encouraging, ordering them to go strongly, you know, in strong words, he's ordering them to go and fight against the Ghassanis and the Romans. And then in the next verse, if you do not go forth, he will punish you with a painful punishment and will replace you with another people. And you will not harm him at all. And Allah is over all things, uh, all things competent. Okay, so therefore he's saying that you have to do it. You are you. You people are chosen to fight against the Romans and the, and the Persians and to spread the final message of Allah. If you do not do it, then Allah is going to destroy you and He's going to replace you with other people. Okay, so, order which is very strong in very strong words, Allah has ordered them to go. So when this revelation comes, then it becomes for the ayn. For the ayn means uh, anyone anyone knows what is for the ayn? and what is for the kafaya. What is the difference between for the ayn and for the kafaya? For the is the individual obligation, and for kifaya is the communal obligation. Okay. So for kifaya can be uh, janaza is for kifaya, yes. Okay. So it's for the is like salah. Okay. So it is for on everyone. So it became for the when the order came. It became for the to participate for every capable man. Okay. So capable means that he is. Uh, not very old, so old people were exempted from fighting, very old people, and they have some wealth, okay, because the expeditions back in the days used to be self-funded. So you have your, your own horse or you have your own camel and you have to go on your own camel. You used to feed it, you used to feed it continuously during the expedition, and that is why people who used to have animals or camel or horse, they were paid more war booty, okay, when there was war booty, they were the people with camels or horses, they were paid more compared to the people who were cab uh, who were uh, infantry. Okay, So infantry were paid less than cavalry. Cavalry is people on horsebacks and infantry is people who are fighting on foot. Okay, So they used to receive less. The people who were fighting on foot used to receive less than the people who fight on horsebacks. So you have, it's a, they have to go to Tabuk way up north. Okay, So therefore it is necessary. They cannot walk. So they need, need to have animals. So people who were extremely poor, they did not have animal, they had nothing. They were exempted as well. Okay, so then uh, a famous incident: Usman Razilatalan, his caravan came, uh, trade caravan came, and it had hundred camels. So Usman Razilatalan donated all the hundred camels towards the battle of Tabuk. Because Muhammad Sallam, when the command came, then Muhammad Sallam is gathering funds for the battle from all the people. He has announced it to the people that uh, fundraising is happening for an expedition that we are for the biggest expedition in uh, for in the history of Islam up until that time. Okay. So the Sahaba giving the money and Uthman Razila Talan donates 100 camels. And then afterwards, then Muhammad Sallam says to Uthman Razila Talan that whatever Uthman does today, it will not harm him. Okay. And which means that Uthman Razila Talan is uh, basically, yeah, he says that it's Uthman Razila Talan can do whatever after this and he's going to be forgiven. So then uh, this particular hadith was used by the Sahaba later when Uthman Razila Talan, when the rebels came, if you remember from last year, when the rebels came against Usman Razilatan and they were accusing him of many different things. So then the Sahaba said that, don't you know that Muhammad Sallam said that Usman Razilatan, that whatever Usman does today, nothing will harm him. Okay. But they did not listen, of course, and then they martyred Usman Razilatan. And then the famous story, which is the competition between Abu Bakr and Umar Razilatan. Okay. So Umar Razilatan took half of his wealth and he donated it to the cause of the book. Okay. To the cause. So then Muhammad said that, Oh Umar, what have you left for your family? 
then umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and said that i have left half of my wealth for my family and then abu bakr radhiyallahu ta'ala and came and then he donated all of his wealth and then umar radhiyallahu oh, sorry imam abu bakr asked him that abu bakr what have you left for your family then abu bakr radhiyallahu ta'ala and said that anyone allah yes allah in his messenger okay so then umar radhiyallahu ta'ala <laughs> realized <laughs> i cannot compete with abu bakr okay so yeah and then there was another incident that when muhammad sallam was asking people to donate then the hypocrites they were giving excuses not to donate and they were also giving excuses not to participate as well okay so their excuses uh, they they were not donating anything and then abu khaisama was one of the sahabi he was a, he was an ansar ansari and when he, when he heard that muhammad sallam is urging people to donate then what he did was he worked all night and he gathered some water and then he sold that water he had a bunch of dates because of that he bought a bunch of dates because of the uh, because of the the money that he got from selling the water and he donated it okay and then the hypocrites they became started making mocking him they said that you are giving this bunch of dates the mohammed the uh, the expedition the people who are going to the expedition they do not need dates but you need the dates okay you are so poor you should you need the dates they do not need it okay so they started mocking the may me get amount of dates that he gave then allah revealed this verse in surah tauba as well so the entire uh, most of the surah is uh, on tabuk so there there are those who slander some of the believers for donating liberally and mock others for giving only a little they can afford allah will throw their mockery back at them and they will suffer a painful punishment so this is a direct uh, they, allah addresses the hypocrites directly that they are mocking but allah is going to punish them severely severely because of this and then there were a few sahabi who were very eager to participate but they were so poor they almost literally had nothing okay. and then muhammad sallam tried to arrange animals for them but for some for some of them he could not arrange it okay so he started they, they started crying and allah revealed in the quran so there is there nor is there any blame those who come to you a prophet for months sorry for mounts which means that they have come for animals then when you said i can found no mounts for you they left with eyes overflowing with tears out of grief that they had nothing to contribute okay so then allah said that these people they also they, they, there is no blame on them that they are not participating in tabuk and they will get the reward as well okay and then muhammad sallam then places muhammad ibn maslama in charge of madina and he uh, asks ali radhiyallahu ta'ala an to stay at madina and to take care of the family of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay wives and the family of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and ali radhiyallahu ta'ala an believe it or not is also mocked by the hypocrites they say that you are uh, you are cowardly so therefore you stayed behind okay and ali ali radhiyallahu ta'ala in all of the battles he's fighting uh, very well right so he's fighting he's he's the main man he's always going up in mubarazas he's fighting against people so he becomes very angry is that angry, angry at um, at this mocking and then he picks his sword and then, and then he went went and goes and joins the army of the muslims then muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that ali ali why are you here i just uh, asked you to stay in madina then ali radhiyallahu ta'ala said that people are mocking me there okay and they're saying me that i'm not man enough to go and then muhammad sallam then said this hadith that you are to me as harun most to musa okay and then he uh, consoled him and then he uh, ali radhiyallahu ta'ala then returned back to madina okay and this was the largest expedition that muhammad sallam had ever commanded and that was uh, about 20000 muslims were in there in the battle of hunain there were about 12000 of them and here we have 20000 muslims so muhammad sallam had sent and three different regions as well so it is now obligatory upon you to participate so 20000 of the muslims are now participating in this first one okay now abu zar al ghifari was one of the sahabi as well very interesting sahabi so he he his camel had some issues okay so now the muslims now they they have left madina they are going to towards tabuk and as you can see madina is here tabuk is north okay north of arabia and this is the roman empire so it's about on the border of the roman empire okay so the roman empire used to have syria used to have jordan so this entire region used to be called sham syria now it is divided into different countries after colonialism but before that it used to be called sham okay now you have jordan you have israel palestine whatever right and so it is very close to sham on the border of the roman empire and it where ghassanids used to be here so they are going to uh, the muslims are going to meet the ghassanids on their own territory okay so 
now abu zar al khafari his camel had some problems so he he was delayed and his camel uh camel had some problems so he just went on his own he left uh, and he worked for two to three days non stop in this heat in order to join the muslims okay so that was the commitment of abu zar al khafari and when the muslims were walking along said tabu so they faced a shortage of food and a shortage of water of course there are 20000 people they had to feed okay and in order to arrange the food for 20000 people uh, they had never done this before okay so the largest the army that they had ever assembled was at hunain but at hunain also makkah was uh, makkah was close to as well okay so but here they are going hundreds of kilometers hundreds of miles and therefore the food and the water starts to run out there are 20000 people so instead of food instead of proper food they start eating leaves in order to sustain themselves and they do not have water so some of the sahabi they start killing their camels so the camels they are riding on they start killing them so that they could drink whatever fluid is within the camel because so they are so desperate now uh, when the muslims are about to die literally quite about to die because of the lack of water then abu bakr radhiyallahu anhu goes to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and says that basically there is nothing you have to do something here right which means that he asked for Uh, the do ask for Muslims to to uh, to for some sort of miracle. Okay, so then Muslims then supplicated to Allah, and then uh, he he continued supplicating until rain came. Okay, and then when the rain came, then the Sahaba they filled up their water canisters and they uh, drank, and therefore they survived. Okay, and then another incident that took place was that the Muslims went through a place which is called Al Hijr, and Al Hijr was. the place where samud used to live okay samud samud you know samud huh? adam samud so which prophet was sent to samud no where was sent to madan madan huh? ibrahim's nephew lut no lut was sent to sodom and gomorrah yeah samud Camel, she camel. Who was given the miracle of she camel? <laughs> no, no, Pale, Pale Sadam. Okay. So, uh, uh, so then Samud was destroyed when they killed the camel. Samud was destroyed. Okay. So Al Hijr was where Samud used to live. Okay, and they still, still to this day, you can see that in the in the mountains they they've carved their entire abode. So they used to be very strong people. So and they used to carve their homes within inside the mountains. So uh, amazing. So uh, Samud was there, and the Sahaba they started. Uh, they were in awe of the of the houses that they were seeing there. Okay, so Al Hijr was the place where Samud Samud used to live. So then Muhammad Sallam mm-hmm. then told them that why are you in awe? Right, you should be more in awe that you have you have you have amongst you a person who's telling you what happened to these people. Okay, you have which means that you have amongst you a prophet of Allah. So therefore, you must be in awe of this instead of being awe of the Samud. And then, when the Sahaba they started drinking from the water that was still there, then Muslim then forbade them from drinking from uh, from that water. Okay, and he said that if you have Sahaba had also mixed it in the flour, okay, in order to make bread. So Imam Zulam also said to them that the flour should be given to the animals. Whatever has been mixed with that water should be given to the animals. And then Imam Zulam said that you should not visit places where Allah's wrath has came, right? Unless you are visiting and you are crying at the same time, okay? Because Allah has punished these people, okay? And then he hurried away from that thing, from Al Hijr. And then when um, the Muslims again are suffering from shortage of water, they don't have water. Their water is over from the rain. So the the water that they stored from the rain is over. So now they are again at the, they are again they are about to die from uh, not having water. Okay. So then Muhammad Sallam then told the Sahaba that tomorrow you will arrive at Tabuk Spring, and so whoever reaches there should not touch its water but wait till I come there. Okay. So the water the spring is going to be Tabuk is a place there you have a spring should not touch its water. I I should uh, when I come then only you can. Touch the water, otherwise don't touch it. Okay, so I mean, he said that wait till I come and then I'll give you the orders what to do, not to touch the water, but I'll tell you what to do. 
then this two of the a few of the sahabi they went there to tabuk and they still went up to the water okay and then and then they touched it so then when muhammad sallam then uh, heard about it then he became angry and he rebuked them why did they uh, touch the water but then what he did was he gathered some of the water he washed his hand and he washed his face with the water and because of that a spring which was which had very little water water became began gushing forth okay and the sahaba they drank and they were again saved at this particular juncture as well okay so twice it happens in this story that the sahaba all of them were about to die because of a lack of water because of extreme dehydration and they were saved okay so during this journey uh muslim was praying uh qasr uh, prayer qasr okay? is the short and short and prayer right so instead of four you pray two okay? and you sometimes combine also the salah the the zuhur and the asr is combined and the uh, maghrib and the isha is also combined okay so that is what the muslims were praying now the muslims reached tabuk okay? after a few days after 15 days about the muslims reached tabuk okay? and at tabuk then muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam stays there for about 20 days okay and in the 20 days that he stays there he delivered sermons so we are going to go through some of the sermons in the next slide and the, an interesting incident that happened at tabuk was that it was the only time the first and the only time that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam played an entire rak'ah behind the sahabi any idea who who that sahabi was Any idea? Can anyone guess? <laughs> Who? <laughs> anyone else guess? Anyone else? Who is the Sahabi? What? No. Keep on saying, and you'll come. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> Only four questions, and then I was looking for that. Ali is still in Medina. <laughs> that was the whole point. I was Abdul Rahman now. Okay. <laughs> I was. I, I mean, I was. I wanted to know if you are paying attention. <laughs> Ali is still in Medina, looking after Ali Bayit. Okay. So I was Abdul Rahman now. So what happened was that <laughs> during uh, Fajr time, then Muhammad Salam was doing wudu, and therefore he. the therefore the uh, he could not come back was delayed okay so then the sahaba they started the prayer they thought that most from is as is getting late and the time of the prayer is going so therefore they started the prayer and abdul rahman bin auf was offering the prayer and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came and the sahaba the commotion started right muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has come so then abdul rahman bin auf understood he started coming back but then muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then asked him to just uh, continue his prayer and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam missed one rak'ah and so therefore he prayed one rak'ah behind, behind abdul rahman bin auf and then after that rak'ah was over then muhammad sallam stood up and prayed another rak'ah okay. and then uh, when muhammad sallam was there then he sent khalid bin walid to qaidir ibn uh, abdul malik of banu kinda okay so he sent him uh, to a place called duma 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 tul jandal it is called is in this state right so that is an ancient arabian city and Dumatul Jandal is an is an Arabian city which is also mentioned in Akkadian sources about ten about uh, three thousand five hundred years ago. This particular city is mentioned in the sources. Okay, so it is somewhere towards the north. Okay, so this uh, Khalid bin Walid was sent there, and because okay, there was the leader, and Muhammad Sallam said to Khalid bin Walid that you are going to find okay there amongst oryxes. Oryxes is like a big deer. The deer they used to be in Arabia. they became extinct but now they are reintroduced in arabia okay so khalid bin walid went there to duma and then at that time um, okay there was uh, hunting these particular oryxes and he was in the midst of these oryxes so khalid bin walid and his contingent they captured okay there and they brought him to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay and then okay there then uh, agreed to pay jizya so now one of the main uh, tribes in the northern front right they are uh, they are now paying jizya to muhammad sallam and have accepted the uh, authority of muhammad sallam and islam okay and then afterwards muhammad sallam also and different delegations so <clears throat> the towns of aila jarba uh, jarba and adru okay so these are the towns in syria so syria mainland syria 
and at the border of Roman Empire. Okay, so now they also agreed to pay jizya. So Muhammad Sallam has protected, basically sealed the northern frontier. So the southern frontier in the central of Arabia is also uh, is already under the control of the Muslims. So now the northern Arabia has also come under the control of the Muslims. Okay. So then afterwards, after this particular uh, treaties were agreed upon, then the Ghassanids then ceased to be a threat to the Muslims. No actual war took place. They did not show up. So no no army of the Ghassanids show, showed up. So no actual war took place. The Muslims were there for 20 days. And then the sermons, so, so I'm going to read some of them. So so the, the, so the first sermon is, to curse a believer is a sin and to fight him is kufr. And to eat of his flesh is a, a sin transgression and the sanctity of his money is like the sanctity of his blood. Okay. And whoever asks for forgiveness, Allah will forgive. Whoever controls his anger, Allah will reward. Right? Whoever is patient at a calamity, Allah will give him better than what was taken away. And whoever wants to show up, Allah will show through him. Uh, I mean, show punishment through him. Okay? And whoever is patient, Allah will give him more. Okay? So this very amazing sermon. And then another thing that Muhammad Sallam said during those 20 days during his sermon was that Allah has given me five things. Okay? Number one, that I have been sent to all of mankind. Okay, the prophets before him were not sent to all of mankind. And then Allah made me victorious by all. So, which means that the army of the Muslims during the Battle of Tabuk, they had such awe that the Ghassanids and the Romans, they did not show up. Okay, number three, Ghanima has been made halal for me. What is Ghanima? What is Ghanima? Or Boti, yes. So, Ghanima was not halal for the, for the previous Ummah, right? So, for example, in the Bible, we read that the Jews used to collect the war booty. Then Allah used to send thunder and that war, not war booty, they used to collect the things that they got from the, the war, the spoils of war, basically. And then Allah used to send a thunder and that will be, that will be burned there at them. Okay. So this was not made halal for previous ummas and that has been made halal for Muslims. Okay? Number four, whole earth has been made a masjid. So the Jews still to this day, they have specific temples, right? So they can only go and pray in the temples, whereas Muslims, they can pray anywhere. Okay. And the fifth one, the fifth uh, thing that Allah has given me, Muhammad Sallam has saved it for the day of judgment in which he's going to intercede on behalf of the Muslims. Okay. And then when the Muslims, when they were going, when they were going back from Tabuk, so on their way back, then the animals of uh, the Muslims, they started becoming very lazy. Okay. So then Muhammad Sallam made a dua that, oh, Allah made these animals fast and let them carry the Muslims, carry the Muslims over the land and the ocean. Okay. So this Sahabi, when he heard ocean, what does that mean? Right. So he could not register what does that mean, ocean. So then he said that, okay, later when during the time of the Umayyads, the Muslims with the first navy. Okay. So when the Muslims were going on expeditions on oceans, then he realized, okay, this is the dua of Muhammad. Okay. And the Muslims, I don't know if I've discussed in last year, I don't think I discussed this last year because we had uh very short time. So the Muslims became very soon after the Muslims started conquering, right? So they were a great land power during the time of the Sahaba, during the time of Khulfa Rashidun. And then during the time of Umayyads, immediately 50, 60 years after the death of Muhammad Sallam, they became a great maritime nation up until the 13th, 14th centuries. And then during the time of the Ottomans as well, up until 17th century, the Muslims were a great maritime nation. Right? And uh, the Persians and the Romans, they were fighting each other for 600 years, because since 53 BC, Battle of Karai, and the Persians defeated the Romans a few times, but they could not occupy Syria. Okay, Syria and these places, why? Because the navy was not as strong as the navy of the Romans, right? So they wanted to just maintain the borders. So the Romans, the, their navies were was very strong. And the Umayyad navy, the nascent Umayyad navy, the new Umayyad navy, defeated the Byzantine navy, navy which was outnumbered, and they were outnumbered three to one. And the Byzantine emperor was there in that movie. So amazing. Like you can imagine the horror in the minds of the Byzantines that <laughs> now they are dominating the seas as well, which will maybe someday we will cover the Muslim domination of the seas, which is extreme, very fascinating topic. Okay. And then there was another incident that took place was that some of the hypocrites which were there in the expedition, they decided to assassinate Muhammad. Okay, so they, the Muslims are going, and therefore, of course, the entire army is not going to be in one place. So there comes a time when Muhammad Sallam is with Huzaifa uh, bin Yaman, one of the Sahabi, and another Sahabi by the name of Hamman bin Yasir. Okay. So then uh, when he is only with them, then a few people come and they try to assassinate Muhammad Sallam. 
but then Allah protects Muhammad Sallam and they get scared and they go 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 away. Then uh, Muhammad Sallam tells to Hudayfa that these are the hypocrites who had come to assassinate me. Okay, and then finally the Muslims return to Medina, and they return to Medina through uh, uh, through a ma through a hill. Right when whenever the uh, whenever people used to go to go from Medina to somewhere else, then their relatives, right, just like we go to the airport, our relatives come to the airport. And then say, they say goodbye, and then we go in the back. Okay. So previously, back in the days when the people used to go from Medina, okay, so then they used to go to this place called Taniya Tul Wada. Okay, Wada means bye bye, the hill of bye bye, the hill of goodbye. Okay, so they used to go there, and then their relatives used to say goodbye, salam, and then they used to leave. The relatives used to go back to Medina. Okay, so the Muslims then come through the Taniya Tul Wada, and therefore the famous some of the Youth, they gather in Saniyatul Wada, and they utter those famous words, right? So, Salal Badu Alayna in Saniyatul Wada. You guys know, where the Bashuku Alayna Mada Alilaida. So this is a, this is very famous words, right? Salal Badu Alayna. You guys have not heard of it? Okay. So whatever. <laughs> yeah, but that is not possible. How is this possible? Because Saniyatul Wada is towards the north. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi arrived from Makkah to Medina. From the south, okay. So therefore, the the correct opinion is, and the opinion that I think I, that the scholars that I have uh, heard, I read about, right, and that I've read from, they say that that was during. Also, Sabiu Rahman Mubarak Kubi, he also in his book he has wrote that this is when they came back from Tabu, and it makes sense because they're coming back from Tabu, and they're coming from the north. So towards when he was come going from Makkah to Medina, he came from the south. Okay. So yeah, this famous these famous words were also recited by the people of Medina. And then the Muslims, this entire expedition took 50 days, in which they spent 20 days in Tabuk. Okay. okay. And finally, another uh, incident that took place was the establishment of Masjid al Now, when the Muslims were going to uh, when the Muslims were going to the expedition of Tabuk. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is asking every, everyone to give a donation. Then the hypocrites, they do not give the donations. And they started building another masjid, just, just near to Masjid of Quba. Okay. And why were they building that masjid? Because Abu Amir, Abu Amir was one of the people from Medina. But then he, when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, he uh, began hating the Muslims and Islam. And he was also a Christian. So he began hating Muslims and Islam, and then he went to the Quraysh. He helped Quraysh during the Battle of Badr and also the Battle of Uhud. And he was the before Muhammad Sallam came. He was one of the chiefs of the people of Medina, okay? Abu Amir, and he was called Abu Amir the monk, okay? So Abu Amir then contacted Abdullah ibn Salul, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, who was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, any idea? The chief of hypocrites, okay? So he contacted Abdullah ibn Ubay. And he told them to establish a, a mosque. Okay, and that mosque is going to be a secret place where the hypocrites are going to gather and they were going to plan whatever they were used to plan against the Muslims. Okay. So then the hypocrites they are not donating before the expedition. And at that time, they are the same time they are spending a lot of money to build build this particular masjid just, just near to the masjid of Koba. So then the hypocrites, when they establish the masjid. Then Abdullah ibn Ubay comes to Muhammad Sallam and then he asked Muhammad Sallam to lead the prayer in Masjid al okay. Muhammad Sallam then asked him, why, why did you make this masjid? Then Abdullah ibn Ubay said that we are weak people, so we, we have established this masjid so that it is closer to our home. Okay. So then Muhammad Sallam says that, inshallah, if Allah wills, I'm going to offer a prayer in, in there. I'm going to lead the prayer when I come back from the expedition. Okay. And then when Muhammad Sallam is coming back from the expedition of Tabuk, then Allah reveals this particular verse in the Quran. Okay. And those hypocrites who took for themselves a mosque for causing harm and disbelief. Okay, the Ran means harm. Okay. So the mosque mosque of harm. And division amongst the believers, and as a station for whoever had bored against Allah and his messenger before, and they will surely swear we intended we intended only the best. And Allah testifies that indeed they are lying. Okay. So Allah will reveal the plans of the hypocrites to Muhammad and the Muslims. And therefore, Muhammad then ordered the Sahaba 
to go and to burn the mosque to the ground. And that is what happened. The Sahaba, they, they burned the mosque, the entire mosque, the Masjid al uh, the entire mosque, which was called Masjid al Dara, to the ground. Okay. Then finally, I will take five minutes more, if that is okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so finally, the important incident of Kaab ibn Malik. Okay. Now, Kaab ibn Malik was from amongst the Ansar and he was present at the Pledge of Aqaba. Right? So, the Pledge of Aqaba was the pledge that the Ansar gave to Muhammad before the migration. Okay. And they said that we are going to protect you. If you are going to come to Makkah, we are going to, sorry, if you are going to come to Medina, we are going to protect you and we are going to offer a place for you and we are going to participate. That is if you do that. This was all the pledge that they gave us that they are going to uh, establish the prayers and the fast, okay? and they are going to participate in boards as well. So he was amongst the Ansar and he also uh, participated in Aqaba, and, but he did not participate in Badr, but he also participated in other battles, Uhud than Khanda. Okay? So he was a prominent Sahabi, Kaab ibn Malik. Now, what happened was that, as I mentioned, that it was the month of July and the harvest season was coming, so ripe fruit was coming. So the month of August usually it was the harvest season, and it was uh, it was uh, the the book was so far away that it was sure that they are not going to come back to harvest their fruits. Okay, so then Kaab ibn Malik he started procrastinating. He started delaying his departure. Okay? Then when he started delaying his departure, he himself said that I had a weakness for ripe fruit and shade. So he was eating ripe fruit, he was relaxing in shade, and he delayed his departure. Now the Muslims they had already left, and he said that okay, I'm going to catch up with them. Right? And he began delaying it until they were so far away that he could not catch up with them anymore. So he stayed in uh, Medina during the entire expedition. Now, when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reaches uh, Tabuk, he asks, he notices that Kaab ibn Malik is not there. So he asks the Sahabi, or Sahabi, who is Kaab ibn Malik? So then the Sahabi says that the, the Sahabi tell, tell him that he is still in Medina. Then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam becomes disappointed. And then when uh, Muhammad Sallam comes back, now people are coming, the hypocrites are coming, and they are offering excuses. Okay, my whatever, right? Whatever excuses they had, they're offering it, and Muhammad Sallam is accepting all of their excuses. Okay, and they're lying and they're ex making excuses. So then Kaab ibn Malik, he goes there, and then he says the truth. Okay, he says that, by Allah, I've never been stronger or wealthier than I was when I remained behind you, which means that I had wealth, I had strength, but I still remain behind. That is a big mistake, right? And I and I ask Allah's forgiveness because of this. Okay. Then Muhammad said that Allah is going to decide on your case. Okay. I cannot decide what what has to be done with you. Allah is going to decide. Okay. Then it was decided that the entire uh, Medina society is going to boycott uh, Kaab ibn Malik. Okay. And then alongside Kaab ibn Malik, there were other two Sahaba as well who were in the same boat, and they were Murara ibn Al Rabi and Hilal ibn Umayya. Okay, so these two three Sahabi were in the same uh, same condition, right? that they were boycotted by the entire people of Medina. So nobody would, uh, they were basically aliens in their own society. So they so Kaab ibn Malik said that he used to go to his brother, ask him questions, but his brother would not respond to him. Okay. And he used to go to the people who used to be friends with him, and he would ask them questions, nobody would respond and say anything. Okay. So 40 days passed by. 40 days, 40 days, no one is talking to you. And then after 40 days, the command comes that they cannot see their wives anymore. Okay, so these three people, they cannot even go back to their wives. So now after this command comes, then Kaab ibn Malik tells his wife that you can go away. So then you can go to the uh, home of your parents and live there till uh, till the, another command comes, right? Till, so, so the uh, wife of Kaab ibn Malik, she goes to the parents' house and then the wife of Hilal, because Hilal was an old man, uh, relatively old, so wife of wife of Hilal said that uh, Hilal is an old man, so let me st stay with him, and I'm going to take care of him. Then Muhammad said, okay, but you cannot go near him. Okay, so Just take care of him, just give him the food, and then go away. Then, then the wife of Hilal then uh, accepted it, and then only Hilal, uh, Hilal's wife was there with him, who was taking care of him, and the other people, they were not even allowed to go near to their wives okay so then uh, after 50 days passed okay and the entire boycott they cannot even go to the family so 50 days passed and then on the uh, 50 nights passed and then on the fajr of 50 the 51st day when Kaab ibn Malik is 
offering the is starting to offer the fajr prayer then a sahabi runs and comes to him that okay come uh, there's a good good news that allah has forgiven him okay and then allah reveals this particular verse right? and he also forgave the three who were left alone right uh, to the point that the earth closed in on them in spite of its vastness and their souls confined them and they were certain that there's no refuge from allah except in him okay then he turned to them so they could repent indeed allah is the accepting of repentance the mercy okay so 50 days they were boycotted 40 days they were socially boycotted and for 10 days they uh, the their family also the wives also boycotted them okay and then after this after this when they uh, passed the test then their repentance was accepted and they were uh, integrated back to society and everyone was happy for them okay jazakallah khair this was a relatively bigger session <laughs> okay we are done any question oh different jizya for different uh, yeah different tribes depending upon their their wealth yeah any question abu abu hurera anyone said ایکسپلین any questions regarding the abu hurairah mm-hmm. mentioned that he suffered from eight months of years in three months yeah. so how come he becomes the biggest medic yes yes so if you are going to you have a you can see a sect or what, what can you call it i don't know So no no not al hadith al <laughs> hadith they are the strict believers in hadith right so the ones who are the opposite so the ones who reject hadith i don't know they are called parvezis in indian subcontinent and yeah and they are called quranist in the in the west and i don't know what they are called if they if they are present in the arab world i don't know right? but uh, they the primary accusation that they gave against hadith is this okay that abu huraira he stayed with them he stayed at muhammad sallam only for 2 years and 3 months and he was able to narrate 5500 hadith how is this possible he must have forged lots of lots and lots of, lots of them and therefore we cannot trust the hadith tradition and therefore we have to only go with the quran and we cannot go with the hadith so you ask them okay so how do you know how to pray oh the prayer is in the heart and whatever all kind of stupid things that they say okay so that that is the main reason that they gave okay and the qadr of allah is that abu huraira already answered this allegation against him so some people also accused him of this during his own life time right so he was narrating a lot of lot of hadith so then uh, the the people said that how come you are narrating so many hadith and you were only there with muhammad sallam during his own life time for 2 years and 3 months so how how is it possible that you you are narrating so many hadith so abu huraira said that the other sahabi they were doing they were busy with their lives okay and abu huraira was amongst the ahl sufa the ahl sufa were the people who used who were very poor and they used to live in the mosque of prophet muhammad okay? and abu huraira was constantly with muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam constantly learning with muhammad sallam so he was a he was a close companion of muhammad sallam he was basically living with muhammad sallam for 2 years and 3 months okay whereas the other sahabi they were involved in their lives they used to be with muhammad sallam for some time and they would not they would not used to be with uh, mausalam for so much time as abu hurairah right so the two years and three months that he spent with mausalam was in constant uh, was he was constantly with mausalam and he spent more time with mausalam in those two years and three months compared to other sahabi they spent in 10 years or 15 years okay? so that is why he was he had an incredible memory as well so umar radhi allahu anhu once tested his memory and then he he had an incredible memory nobody could question his memory and therefore he was able to narrate more hadith than any other sahabi 
any they were here. Yeah. We don't have any source from the Rasanis why they did, did not come. So the Muslim sources say that they, they were in awe of the army and they did not come. Because the army was 20,000. The Muslims did not know how to manage the logistics. Okay. One of the one of the primary lessons that the Muslims learned from this the the hikmah that was we can all only speculate, right? So Allah basically put them through this test so that they know what expeditions are like to the Romans and the Persians. Okay. So now after this particular expedition, then the Muslims became confident that they can take on the Romans and the Persians. Okay? No, but they passed several cities, right? On the yes. way. So didn't they have a source of water of some sort? Maybe they but it was a desert, right? So therefore maybe it was the month of July and the water was scarce. No question? Okay. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.